Hi everybody and welcome. Um, my name is Ella Saltmarsh. Uh, I am a co-founder of the Long Time Project and we'll just give people another couple of minutes to, to get themselves here on time. Um, and perhaps while we're waiting for people, uh, you could write in the chat where in the world you are at this point and how does time feel to you today? So where are you? And I'll write in the, the question in the chat. How does time feel to you today? And while we're waiting for people to join us, um, we can find out a little bit more about time and each other. So we've got Alistair in Dundee who says that there's never enough time Caitlin in London uh, is saying time is flying. Uh, Catherine in Liverpool talks about time evaporating. Dora in Helsinki is running out of time too. Lou in Vermont talks about time feeling precious. Um, Indra in Johannesburg says time feels fluid. Uh, Irwin in Cleveland says there's never enough time. Devon in Montreal talks about time being fluid. Um, Rashmi from Mumbai, uh, oh, it's moving so fast, says time feels heavy. Um, so yes, so, so time is feeling, um, we're feeling time today, collectively. Um, I'm gonna kick off. Um, so I'd like to start by welcoming you all to this long time session. Um, I am the co-founder of the Long Time Project and this is a session that is funded by EIT Climate Kick and that we're hosting in partnership with the RSA and the Serpentine's General Ecology Network that is supported by Outset Partner Grants. So before we get going, just a housekeeping point. So we purposefully not made this a webinar because we are growing a community around the long time and we want this to feel like a community, not a lecture. Um, but in order to get the most out of today, if you haven't already changed the settings to speak of you, I recommend you do that so that you are not overwhelmed by the incredible gallery of people here from all over the world. Um, so it is great to see so many of you here today, um, particularly in a week like this week, where a lot of the issues that threaten our long time survival as a species are right in our face in the short term. You know, some issues like climate change, biodiversity loss, pandemics, like none of these are speculative anymore. They are issues that are affecting all of our lives right now. And I think one of the things about these times of crises is that they can cause us to hunker down. Um, it can be very difficult to look up from the immediate when we are under threat. And I think one of the challenges that all of us face right now is how do we respond to these very real needs in the present whilst also attending to needs of the future? And for all of us on this call today, you know, as, as humans in um, the kind of unfolding history of our species, we have a disproportionate amount of responsibility for future lives on this planet. Like the decisions that we take over the next few decades will affect billions of future lives, human and otherwise. And so this is why we've set up the Long Time Project to really look at how do we cultivate care for that world that will exist beyond our lifetimes so that we take responsibility for it today. And that is why I'm really delighted to um, host such an exceptional panel today of people who are pioneering long-termism in different fields from politics to law to finance to philosophy. Um, I hope that after this session, um, you will see that long-termism isn't something that is abstract and utopian, um, but is something that is very practical and is being actioned by people uh, in very different parts of our society. And so I am going to stop speaking um, and I am gonna hand the baton firstly over to Roman. Um, for those who don't know Roman Krasnarik, he is a public philosopher and a longtime collaborator of ours. 
Um, his new book, The Good Ancestor, How to Think Long-Term in a Short-Term World, has been described by you two's The Edge as the book our children's children will thank us for reading. I can second that, having um, read it cover to cover. It is a brilliant book. And he is someone who spent the last few years exploring and mapping this territory of, of getting long-term. So I can think of no better guide to the space. Um, so Roman, handing over to you. Thanks so much for that lovely introduction, Ella. Um, so what I'd like to tell you in this short moment is this, is that I believe that we stand at a pivot point in history, that never before has humankind had the capacity to wreak such devastating impacts on future generations, partly due to the potential impacts of climate change, uh, technological risks such as lethal autonomous weapons powered by AI, genetically engineered pandemics, the press of the nuclear button and the dumping of nuclear waste, and of course, the racial injustice and inequalities of wealth which get passed on from generation to generation. And I think there's a kind of paradox here that the need for long-term thinking to tackle these issues is incredibly urgent. We need it right here and right now. And one of the ways I think about this problem is depicted really well in this cartoon you should be able to see there from Kendra Allenby. Just have a look at that for a moment. And this cartoon was developed in a project, in fact, with EIT Climate Kick, where I worked with cartoonists who responded to some of the ideas in my book. And this cartoon was partly a response to a metaphor in my book, which is where I talk about the way that humankind has colonized the future, that we treat it like a distant colonial outpost where we can freely um, dump ecological damage and technological risk as if there was nobody there. And there you can see all those things we are dumping on future generations. And the tragedy is that all those future generations aren't here to challenge this pillaging of the, their inheritance, this dumping in the attic. Um, they can't throw themselves in front of the king's horse like a suffragette or stage a sit-in like a civil rights activist or go on a salt march to defy their colonial oppressors like Mahatma Gandhi. They're granted no political rights or representation. They have no influence in the marketplace. And I think it's really hard though to grasp the scale of this injustice. And one of the ways to, I think, think about it is depicted in this great diagram developed by Richard Fisher um, called the scale of unborn generations. So there in the little green circle are the living, the 7.7 .7 billion of us alive today. Over the past 50,000 years, an estimated 100 billion people have been born and died. But over the next 50,000 years, nearly 7 trillion people will be born, assuming this century's birth rates level out and remain constant. So they far outweigh everyone has lived and died. And there in that big orange circle are all your grandchildren and their grandchildren and the friendships and communities and people on whom they'll depend. And I think there's a real question there staring at us, which is how are we going to be remembered by these future generations and how are we going to act with their, their welfare in mind. Now, a lot of people say to me, they say, well, look, there's no hope really. You know, human beings are just driven by short-term rewards and instant gratification and pressing the buy now button. And that's partly true. But we are also long-term thinkers and wired for it. Look at human history. And you will see over the last 5,000 years, extraordinary examples of what's known as cathedral thinking. People embarking on projects which sometimes have time horizons lasting decades or even centuries. Things that will never be finished within people's lifetimes. Think under religious buildings there, such as Alminster in Southwest Germany, a Lutheran church that took over 500 years to build, wasn't finished till 1890. Or social movements like the suffragettes uh, in the UK, whose campaign for votes for women took over 50 years to achieve its central aims. Or scientific endeavors like the Svalbard Global Seed Vault in the Arctic Circle, which is holding and collecting over millions and millions of seeds in an indestructible rock bunker, which is designed to last a thousand years. And these 45 examples you can see there are from my book, The Good Ancestor. But note too that this kind of cathedral thinking isn't always good for us. Look under infrastructure, all of those canals, for example, 
have required pouring concrete. Enough concrete has been poured by human beings now to cover the whole earth in a spherical coffin, two millimeters thick, even covering all of the oceans. And of course, that concrete is very high in terms of impact and carbon emissions. So we need to think about how we are going to create a, a society based on cathedral thinking, which respects both people and planet. And I think in order to do that, a great starting point is the human imagination. We need to imagine what this long-term civilization might look like. And I'd like you to just take you on a little journey there just for a brief moment. I want you to imagine a city. I think of it as Longtopia, where long-term thinking has become the norm. And you walk down there and what do you see on the high street? Well, on the left is the Pinnix, which is the ancient Greek term for the civic assembly area. And there are two groups of people having a vigorous debate about the plans for the transport and education and, and water supplies of their town. One of the group looks like in, in normal clothes and the other half of them are in great silken green kimonos. And their decision making is actually based on a real model in Japan today called future design, where city residents are invited to discuss and draw up plans for where they live, split into two groups. The first group are told, or half of them are told they're residents from the present day, and the other half are actually given ceremonial green kimonos to wear and told that they're residents from 2060. And those who imagine themselves in 2060 come up with far more radical plans when it comes to healthcare investment or climate change action. And I think this movement is spreading is across Japan. It's in big cities like Kyoto, and that's the kind of decision-making that happens in Longtopia. But as you go further down the street, on the other side, there's a park and there's a giant composting facility. And there's a bunch of people sitting around having lunch and they are eating their own clothes. And what they're doing is actually being inspired by the Swedish company Houdini, a maker of hiking gear, where they have completely compostable clothes made out of wools, and they have a composting facility where customers can dump their old clothes, they, the clothes turn into soil, and they can have meals made out of their old hiking jacket. And that's something that's happening in Longtopia as part of the circular economy, a closed loop with no waste. Walk on a bit further, there's a bunch of kids getting their new scout badges. And here is the latest badge, if you can see that. Um, they're getting a good ancestor badge, maybe a Time Rebel badge, maybe even an XR badge as well over here. And then on the other side of the street, there's some teenagers who are all on their phones and um, they're shopping. But instead of pressing a buy now button, um, they've got a buy later button. And when you press the buy later button, there's a drop down menu and you can buy the item right now. Or it says you can, there's an option to buy in a week or buy in a month or buy in a year or borrow from a friend. So you press buy in a year, you'll get an email in a year's time. Uh, reminding you, asking you if you really want to buy that second yoga mat or not. A little further down, there is the town clock, but it's not a town clock. It's a donut dial, and on it is the economist Kate Rayworth's donut of social and planetary boundaries, showing whether the uh, city is overshooting on planetary boundaries or bringing people above a basic uh, social foundation of, of human rights and basic needs. And then um, we're nearly finished the journey now. There is a, there's a forest with a thousand trees there and it's been inspired. It says future library on a big sign and that's inspired by the Scottish artist Katie Patterson's 100 year art project future library where every year for 100 years a famous writer is donating a book which will remain completely unread until the year 2114 when the collection of books will be printed on paper made from a thousand trees housed um, made from uh, this, this forest of trees which have been planted already outside Oslo. So that is a great uh, inspiration too. And then finally, down just the end of the high street in Longtopia is the Ministry for the Future, a beautiful regenerative building. And if you walked inside there, you'd find the offices of the Future Generations Commissioner for Longtopia. And you would also find courts of law where legal cases are being judged with reference to Longtopia's constitution, which grants rights to future generations as well as to current generations. But I can't tell you too much about that because I know Julia and Sophie are going to be talking about those aspects of Longtopia or something like it. But I'd just like to stop now and just really say that what I'm trying to tell you, of course, is that the time rebellion is here. There are organizations and people and movements all trying to extend our time horizons. They are experimenting. They are uh, inspiring us. And we need to realize this is happening in areas of culture, economy, and politics. We need to do more of these experiments. We need to draw 
or join the dots of these various movements. And ultimately, we need to use our imaginations to envision what a long now civilization looks like. And if we do that, I believe we can become the good ancestors that future generations deserve. And with that, I'd like to stop. Great, thank you so much, Roman, for setting the scene. Um, and as you say, some of these um, residents of Longtopia are, are with us today. Um, and actually, uh, one of them, um, who is an existing Future Generations Commissioner. So um, I am going to hand the baton in a moment to Sophie Howe. Um, Sophie was appointed in 2016 as the first Future Generations Commissioner for Wales. Um, Wales is a global pioneer in this space as they've legislated to protect future generations um, with something called the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act in 2015. And so Sophie's role is to act as a guardian for the interests of future generations in Wales. Um, so Sophie, it would be great if you could tell us how, how does one do that? Tell us about the practicalities of, of your work as Future Generations Commissioner. Well, I suppose the, um, the starting point is the, um, the <clears throat> however many trillion were in um, Roman's kind of orange, um, orange bubble there. Um, they don't speak to me um, very much because obviously they don't, um, they don't exist yet. So I suppose there's a, a really valid question of, you know, how can someone represent the interests of uh, future generations? Um, is it a role which is, um, you know, sort of a bit of, astrology and clever predicting of future trends and scenarios and you know to some degree um, it is about that but actually um, I think that um, if we think about um, protecting the interests of future generations um, in a way which jumps us straight to you know what does the future look like let's think about how we take into account all of these trends we're missing a really key point um, which is the things that we pretty much know are fairly certain to happen climate change, an aging population, um, uh, artificial intelligence, automation, um, and so on. We're not actually even dealing um, with those issues that we are fairly certain about, let alone the kind of um, the huge range of possibilities of um, what the future might look like. So my job, I guess, is really trying to hold our politicians, our policymakers, and indeed um, those in a broader set of public bodies um, in Wales to account in terms of how they meet the um, needs of future generations, or as it says in our law, how they meet today's needs without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. Um, and there are a number of um, interesting aspects of, um, of our legislation. So first off, um, is that you know, we are the only country in the world to have legislated to protect the interests of future generations. Secondly, it's called the well-being of future generations, not the needs of future generations act. And when you apply that concept of well-being, it gives you a much more holistic um, sense of the things that we should be doing. So the Oxford English um, definition of needs is of necessity, and the definition of well-being is the state of being happy, healthy, and comfortable. Now, if we're you know, not having our needs met, then arguably we're not going to be happy, healthy, and comfortable. But actually, it takes us into this kind of broader concept. And it also sets out um, a, a vision for the Wales that we want to see. Now, uh, Roman and I did discuss this beforehand, but as he was talking, I thought, oh my god, this is amazing, because um, if I can share my screen um, a moment, here is um, Longtopia. Give me a second. So this is um, my recent Future Generations report, um, and you can, you can find it on my um, website. And each of these little um, buttons um, tell us more about the vision of the Wales that we are trying to create. So when the legislation was um, taken to the Assembly, um, the other interesting thing that happened with it is that it set out seven long-term uh, goals, a vision for the Wales that we want to um, we want to see, the Wales that we want to leave behind to our children and our grandchildren. Now that really shouldn't be revolutionary. Um, setting out a country, setting out long-term um, goals, but it is actually quite revolutionary because the longest term goals generally we ever see are the sort of four to five year um, manifesto commitments um, and that's where they tend to end. So by setting out this in, um, in law, it goes beyond um, political terms. 
um, and it takes us into this sort of long-term vision. And if you, um, so it's quite difficult to see there, but the goals of prosperous Wales and resilient Wales, a healthier Wales, a more equal Wales, a Wales of cohesive communities, a Wales of vibrant culture and thriving Welsh language, and a globally responsible Wales. And these um, goals were um, devised um, following a national conversation with the citizens of Wales, okay, not the future generations, because as I said, they um, don't talk to us very often, but with the citizens of Wales to say, what is Wales should you want to leave behind to your children, your grandchildren, future generations to come? And each of these goals have their own um, statutory definition. And again, that's one of the interesting aspects of our legislation because these statutory definitions um, are really quite progressive. So there's nothing there really that could be controversial in terms of, you know, doesn't every country want to be prosperous, resilient, more equal, so on, so on. But actually, if you look at our definition of prosperity, as set out in law, not just in some aspirational policy document. It is a productive, innovative, low carbon society um, which uses resources efficiently and proportionately, including acting on climate change, and which focuses on developing a skilled and well educated population with access to decent work. Now, if you take each one of those elements, um, productive, innovative, low carbon, using resources efficiently and proportionately, focusing on skills and decent access to decent jobs, not just any old jobs. That takes us, especially when you combine that with the requirements that are on our um, politicians and our public bodies to deliver against each, each aspect of these wellbeing goals, it really takes us in quite a progressive direction. So, yeah, I suppose, is the vision. Um, for what this goal, what these goals would look like if we were indeed in um, Longtopia. And we definitely didn't collaborate on this, um, but I was um, really amused to hear uh, Roman talk about the scouts and the um, future generation badge, because that is actually one of the things that is happening in Wales with the scouts. They are developing um, through the Future Generations Act, a Future Generations badge. And um, what you'll also see here, um, there's lots of little detail, um, the way in which all four pillars uh, of well-being set out in our legislation are considered. So the duties on public bodies are to improve the social, economic, environmental and cultural well-being. Um, few things there, no one pillar of well-being takes priority over another. So this kind of... Um, what we've seen in the past is, you know, the economy taking priority over any other aspect of well-being is a thing of the past in Wales in statutory terms. Also, that addition of culture, which is missing actually from the UN Sustainable Development Goals, um, and is actually critically important. So you'll see here how we're embedding Welsh poetry um, on our um, on our river there how we are um, bringing in sporting activity with the women's rugby team here, um, how we are embedding cultural activity um, all around um, our Longtopia, if you like. Um, I suppose my job then is to hold our public bodies to account on how they actually um, deliver this vision. I'll stop sharing um, this screen. Um, how do I go about doing that? Well, I think that there's something, you know, I don't have powers to stop things happening or to make people do things. So I don't have powers of veto or anything like that. Um, my powers, I guess, are name shame powers. So um, the, the ability to be a voice for future generations and to call out the government and others when they're not acting in the interest of future generations. So when our government thought that um, it was a good idea to spend all of its borrowing capacity um, building an extension to one of our major uh, motorways. My intervention, asking them how that was compatible with the law that they had passed, um, actually changed the decision there. So please explain to me how building a motorway is in line with um, our aspiration to have a low carbon Wales. Please explain to me how building a motorway and spending that am amount of money um, on that is compatible with our goal of more socio-economic, um, so socially, um, sorry, economically equal Wales. So for those people who don't have access to cars because they're living in poverty, how is that spend actually going to help to address that socioeconomic disadvantage and meet the goal of a more equal Wales? Please explain to me how this is going to meet the goal of a more healthy Wales when we don't want everyone sitting in their cars, we want them travelling actively, we want them on public transport and so on. And quite frankly, the government weren't able to defend their position and the proposal was scrapped. 
So it's a real life example, I suppose, of, and there are many others, of the power of having someone to call out and to hold people, hold governments to account um, in terms of what they're doing uh, to protect the interests of future generations. Um, alongside our goals, the, um, the legislation provides lots of the toolkit, I suppose. What are the ways in which, which we should be acting in order to reach those long-term um, goals? And it sets out five ways of working. Um, the minister who took the legislation through described it as the Common Sense Act um, because it sets out these ways of working which are decision makers who take into account the long-term impact of the things that they do. They should aim to prevent problems from occurring or from getting worse. They should integrate their thinking, so they should do things that make the biggest contribution to each of our well-being goals and avoid doing the things that has um, the least contribution. They should collaborate with each other and other sectors and they should involve citizens. All of that, absolutely common sense. Um, unfortunately, common sense isn't often um, that common in public policy making um, terms, which is why, again, you need someone independent to be able to call them out um, when they get things wrong. So I just want to say a little bit about what's changing. What does this mean in, on the ground? What does it mean to, um, you know, to Mrs Jones, if you like? Um, I've given an example of the M4. But let me also tell you about some of the real innovative and holistic thinking that our legislation is um, prompting. I can see um, Graham on the call from the Wales Millennium Centre and Graham and I have been um, plotting um, recently around how can we um, address the COVID recovery issues around the challenges facing critical professionals who've lost income and so on and do that in a way which then embeds that creative thinking in the way that public services are delivered. So, Quite soon, I hope um, the government um, has taken on board the uh, Principles of the Future Generations Act are going to be looking at creative participation income. So a bailout for creative professionals, which is paired with putting them into public services to um, plan and design hospitals using creative thinking, to think about how volunteering and public services would be delivered differently. This is the sort of policies that you get when you have that holistic um, nature set out in law. Um, in our capital city, Cardiff, um, it's a capital city that is lighted by huge um, disparities in uh, life expectancy. So if you live in the north of the city, you'll be living 10 years longer on average than those living in the south of the city. The south of the city is predominantly made up of black and minority ethnic communities. They're communities who have the lowest life expectancy, they're communities who live in the highest areas of air pollution. They have the worst long-term prospects. By bringing our legislation together holistically, a public health professional was seconded to the um, local authority to lead on the development of the transportation strategy because our law requires that integra integration. Now that's quite interesting in, in of itself. What happens differently when you put a long-term public health lens to the transport problem? What happens as a result of that is an eightfold investment, um, increase in the investment in active travel. What happens is that that investment in active travel is targeted at those communities with the lowest level of life expectancy, the highest levels of air pollution, to reduce air pollution and get them travelling actively. What you see is GPs in Cardiff and um, doctors being able to prescribe um, bikes on prescription free of charge to those people who would benefit from that physical activity. And what you see is the cycle lanes constructed using stable urban drainage, cleaning and greening communities and creating space for nature. So that is the holistic nature of what our legislation is achieving in one um, relatively small example. We have a huge, um, you know, a huge amount of work to do. I don't want to keep anyone saying we've absolutely cracked it. But what people tell me, um, these frustrated champions that I call them, in our public sector organisations, in our public um, policy institutions, those people who for a long time have been able to see that there's a better way of doing things, but they've been frustrated of a system, by a system of old, a short-term system. And what they tell me is that our legislation gives them permission to challenge that system and to drive innovative ideas. And I think it's those frustrated champions um, alongside um, the voices of our younger generations um, and those who are passionate about leaving the world better than they found it. Um, I think those are the people who will really make the change and make our legislation um, walk the talk. Thank you.
Great, thank you, Sophie. Um, and having spent this year working with policymakers all around the world on long termism, I can safely say that Wales is the kind of beacon that people all over the world are looking to to, to learn how to do this work. Um, so, so if Sophie is pioneering long termism in politics, then Julia is pioneering long termism in the law. Um, so Julia Olson is the founder, ED and chief legal counsel of our Children's Trust. Um, Julia founded our Children's Trust over a decade ago um, when as a mother of young children she realised that the greatest threat to her kids and to children everywhere was climate change. Um, so she's lead counsel in a case called Juliana versus the United States, which is a constitutional climate change case brought by 21 young people against the US government for violating their Fifth Amendment rights to life, liberty, property and public trust resources. Um, Julia is also calling in from Oregon today, um, which as we know is in the midst of terrible fires that are ravaging the country. Um, and not only that, but it's also now only 5.30 a.m. Um, for her. So Julia, firstly, like a huge thank you for overcoming quite a lot of obstacles um, and being with us today. And it would be great if you could talk more about how you're using the law to protect the rights of future generations. Thank you so much, Ella, and the Long Term Project and everyone for having me. I'll do my best to be coherent this morning. Um, I'd like to just start um, on that note of what it's like in Oregon right now, if I can share my screen for a moment. Uh, let's see, can people see that? So this, this is one of um, the youth I advocate on behalf of Alex on his farm just uh, about an hour south of us in Eugene, Oregon. Um, this was last week, what it looks like. Um, and for 11 days, our skies have been red and orange and gray and our air has been the most toxic in the world. And it, just last night for the first time, we were able to go outside and, and take a deep breath uh, safely. So that was really remarkable and I'm, I'm glad to be here with a little bit of, of fresh air today. So I'm gonna stop that for a moment. Um, I, I'll start by just talking about our Children's Trust and, and what we do. And we are a, a public interest law firm and we represent only youth and we work only on climate change. And we have three core principles. One is we advocate for youth around the world and for future generations, both for their present and their long-term climate rights. And in doing so, it's very important to us that we're uplifting the voices of young people on this issue and giving them platforms to be heard by uh, the people in power around the world. Two, we advocate only for science-based remedies and remedies that address systemic pro the systemic problems of climate change rather than the, the sort of individual actions that contribute to the crisis that we're in. And I'll talk more about that because I think it's a really important component of long-termism. And three, we sue governments to protect the fundamental and unalienable human rights of, of young people and those who will come after us. And and so I'll talk a little bit about that law as well. But right now we have cases pending on behalf of youth from uh, across the United States, from Washington to Florida. We'll argue a case actually later this afternoon in the state of Washington where fires are burning as well. And we have a North American front of climate litigation against the federal governments of Canada, the United States and Mexico now. We have cases pending in countries from Pakistan to Uganda. And by my count, I believe there are approximately 20 cases against governments around the world, all on behalf of youth and um, inspired or supported by our Children's Trust. So we're really excited about the growing number of cases. So I think, you know, the people we represent, children and future generations are core to this conversation. 
so I won't say much more about that, but I want to talk about the, the um, legal principle next, and then I'll turn to the science. So what's really interesting is this concept of that Sophie was talking about, about embodying in law the protection of future generations of our posterity actually is a very ancient legal concept. And it's one of the core laws that we work with. It's known as the public trust doctrine. And that law was written by Emperor Justinian in 534 CE. So <laughs> the year 534, there was a law that basically said that the resources we all share in common, our air, our water, our coastlines, all of these things are held in trust for not just the present generation, but future generations. And so hopefully most of you are familiar with the concept of a trust. And the, the public trust doctrine, is it's very simple. The government is the trustee. The beneficiaries are the citizens. And not just living citizens, but the citizens to come far, far into the future. And the core of the trust is uh, those resources that are essential to life and that give life. And that law that was in the Roman code is actually, um, has, comes to the United States through the King of England and the law of England and, and then through all of the countries that, that were colonized. Um, it's also embedded in the laws of civil law countries. And so, this is a law that really you find around the world. And one of my favorite scholars, Gerald Torres, uh, a professor here in the United States, says that the public trust doctrine is actually the paper on which constitutions are written. It is the core of government. And so in addition to the public trust doctrine, we do look to constitutions and the rights that are embodied, embodied there. And many constitutions around the world also have provisions that protect not just life and liberty of, of the people living today, but the people who will come um, in the future. And that's really the core legal part of our work. But all of our work is informed by science. And I think there's a, there's a real debate going on today about what is possible in terms of the climate crisis. What can we do? How much can we stop? How much can we protect? And when I seek to answer those questions, you can look in from a lot of, you can look in a lot of directions, but scientists have such a crucial role to play because climate change in many respects is a numbers game. And we can look to science to tell us how bad things will get at certain levels of heating or certain levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, for example. And there's amazing projections about this now. And so I'll just tell you a number that's very important to our work. It's the number 350 parts per million. It's the number um, one degree Celsius or lower. And unlike the, the sort of goals that the Paris Agreement set of keeping warming below two degrees Celsius or 1.5, we really strive for levels of warming that will eventually be protective for future generations. So in our work, we are not looking at 2050, we are looking at 2100 and beyond for what we need to do as a society and the world we need to leave, just not just the plaintiffs and the youth we represent today, but the youth who will come after them, their children and their grandchildren, because these young people are truly thinking about their children and, and the, their family members who have not yet been born. And so our legal obligation as advocates is really to represent those interests and bring the best science and evidence into the courtroom. And um, one of our, I'll just end on this, and it is the Juliana case. And let's see if I, I want to show you a picture of, of the youth who we represent because they are, they are the heart um, of our work. Let's see. So these are the 21 young people who are suing the US federal government. And um, they come from all over the United States and they're an amazing group of people. And, and I think young people are our closest connection to the future and to future generations. And so they really truly need a voice and, and we're the law firm 
that represents them. And thank you very much. Great, thank you, Julia. Um, yeah, I mean, it's incredible to get the legal perspective um, and even more powerful given that you are in the very heart of, of, of a crisis that um, will be affecting future generations increasingly. Um, so um, we have talked about politics, we have talked about law, um, we are now going to move on to finance. Um, so in a moment, I'm gonna hand over to Indy Johar, um, Indy is a founding director of Zero Zero and Dark Matter Labs, um, and he's someone who is at the forefront of rethinking the foundational infrastructure of our lives. Um, and he does that in different ways. He's a pioneer in the field of systems change, um, the future of urban infrastructure, of outcome-based investment and the future of governance. Um, he's also a, a collaborator of ours at the Long Time Project. And so I'm really excited to hand the baton over to Indy to take us um, into the world of long-termism in finance. Um, <clears throat> it's a tall order. Um, so firstly, I just it's an incredible conversation we've had. And it's been such a privilege listening to everyone uh, and the viewpoints. And I want to perhaps add one other dimension to this conversation, which I think is um, maybe relevant. And I, I, and I want to put forward the hypothesis that short-termism is a designed construct. Um, and is a designed construct of inequality. So it is a construct of inequality, which actually means that some people have the privilege to think long-term and many don't. And I think it's important to see the injustice of long-termism at the front end of this conversation. And so I want to start there. And then the hypothesis, and it is a hypothesis that I want to put forward to us as a group, because there's amazing people here, is that, that precariousness, our economy is designed to accelerate precariousness, i.e. making us vulnerable, fragile, as, uh, as agents in order to survive. Our economic thesis, our thesis of how we put people to work, how we incentivize people to work, it is designed as a construct to make us precarious because the precariousness allows us to be instrumentalized for the economy. In that thesis, we thereby create the construct for short-termism, i.e. short-term thinking. If you make people precarious, short-term rewards and this is often recognized so if you go into an economic recession what happens is actually buying patterns change buying patterns resort to psychological goods which are short-term returns so that feeds a typology of consumption and engagement with the world which is around psychological relief chocolate buying all the way through to hairdressers cheap clothes these go up weirdly in a recession because what they do is it's about psychological fulfillment. It's not the utility of those things. It's a psychological relief of those things. So if we sort of see uh, precariousness, then short-termism combined with effectively um, what I would call a, a sort of a narcissism, constructed narcissism in our technologies, you start to create a stack, which is very much driving our economy and locked into a way of thinking and operating into economy. Now, let's flip this for a moment. So that was kind of just, I wanted to acknowledge that, and I want to acknowledge that, that those, that reality is locked in. There are lock-ins that are holding that, us to that position. It isn't just a de facto nice thing. There, there are economic interests, there are cycle of economic models, language. So if I was to Google, um, if you were to Google uh, free market, in the in in google right now you would probably see in the top one investopedia investopedia defines free market as free feudalism if you look at the nine categories it defines it's really nothing to do with markets everything to do with the agency of individuals and the freedom of agency of individuals so in the construction of language in the construction of how we finance in the cost construction of how we how we think and how we operationalize our labor laws they are designed to optimize a very particular model so if we want to make, and you know, I think Julia was also mentioning, also in our thesis of property rights. So the thesis of rights, of so property rights come from a very particular thesis of control and enslavement of things to your needs. 
So that, that is the structure of a relationship. So we, we, we enslave things to our needs. And then the law starts to, starts to manage that enslavement to reduce the impact on the common goods and the public, the goods that we have in trust. So there's a really interesting question for me that if we want to move from that reality to a new reality, it is equally important in, in, in Longtopia for us to create the psychological, the social neurological conditions for all of society to think long. And that I think is a really important prerequisite for us to be able to move forward. And it's not just the long of our environmental goods, it is the long of all of us to be active agents of democracy to advance that reality. And, why, and then if we want to take that forward, this is where I would argue, and this has been some really interesting stuff. So Thomas Bjorkman from the Nordic Secret writes really eloquently about the role of things like Volk schools, the people schools that were established in the 19th century in, in, in Sweden, are, and their role in creating self-authoring citizens. So 10% of the population, and when the Nordics were one of the poorest countries in the world, and I do mean the poorest countries in the world, were actually went to these schools where you were taught philosophy and techniques and technology, technique. And the relationship being able to be self-authoring gave people the freedom to be able to create their own futures. So the construction of self-authoring, self-authoring capacity, what is the human development framework required to build long-termism? What are the institutions required to build that? Then, you know, people talk about universal basic income, and I say universal basic income is not just a problem of welfare. It's not a welfare solution. It's a different, it's an infrastructure for a new type of economy, which allows us to be able to unlock ourselves in radical ways. Then if you layer that into human development in terms of actually the cognitive capacities of humans and the cognitive capacity to care, extending our timelines of care, that requires a different thesis. So what I would like to say, just as kind of as a complement to this conversation, is that I think we need to think about the human development, technological and ecological stack that creates the conditions for all of humans to think long term and be long term. And that is a vital component to the trajectory we take forward. And that, in, in many ways, is really our, a lot of the focus that we're on. And that requires us to think about things that you know, have been brought up in a lot of, and in a way, if you look at our thesis of how we, why we consume, why are trees perceived as, as, a, as, an, as a liability? So the trees on your street are effectively seen as a liability. They, their costs are in terms of insurance costs for the damage they create and in terms of actually the, the, the maintenance costs they preserve, which is why most trees get chopped down after 10 years. Whereas the lifespan of a tree can, the most extraordinary trees can be over three and 3,000 3, plus years. But, but good trees actually only really start to produce the environmental benefits in a 40 year cycle. So when you can't see the maturity of value of a tree because it never lasts that 40 years and our economic models don't allow for us to think in that way, our budgeting structures don't think that way, we, account, we don't account for the social service or the environmental services they produce, we no longer fund trees. So the trees that we have are non-useful in terms of environmental services, in terms of actually heat island effects, all the things that we think are really vital. And that's just using trees as an example. I could pick other social goods that we actually deal with and deploy, uh, destroy. So the public health of a nation is a strategic asset, an intangible strategic asset of a nation, as we've just found. So the question I say is that unless you can put that intangible civic asset on the balance sheet of government and for it to the asset to be recognized, we will never create the long-term intergenerational cycles of wealth required to address and drive that. So these assets are long assets. Health is not a short-term asset, it's a longitudinal asset, as is education. And to round this conversation up, because I would re there's just the most extraordinary group of people here, um, um, is that we have to start, to, and you know, we did a little bit of a survey with the next generation high net worth individuals, uh, a bank in Berlin, and we asked them, sort of, if you were investing in a hundred year cycle, where would you invest? Now, this is, I, and I'm, I'm going to bring this up because I think it's just interesting to see how long, long term thinking thinks about the future because they think about intergenerational wealth in a different way. And I found that 
really fascinating. So I'd love to just share that with you. Uh, Ella, that'll be literally about two seconds or sort of a few, uh, a few seconds and I will uh, yield. Um, so, so one thing is they were relatively optimistic about the future, which I thought was fascinating. 90% um, chance that human civilization will survive in some format over the next 100 years. Um, strategies of bunker wealth, relatively low. Strategies of escape wealth, escape to Mars, well, well they were on the table. Uh, restoration uh, tech and wealth, well, there was actually significant, or well, the bias was towards that. And status quo, well, actually was still on the table, just to kind of put some benchmarks in. But the really interesting thing was here. If you were investing in a 100-year bond, where would you invest? Education, health, natural ecosystems, agriculture. Two of those three are intangible uh, assets. The third one, natural ecosystems, we don't know how to invest in, really. And agriculture actually is a is a, almost a reserve reserve um, uh, is a kind of hedge against a lot of the risks that, risks that we're talking about. But what you start to see is these intangibles currently are you know we can invest in a school, but we don't invest in the education or the educational learning environment of a child. We can invest in the instruments or the residual uh, infrastructures of it, but not the actual investment. So what is how do we do that? I think is really interesting. The other part that I would like to share is the thinking was entirely focused on, you know, if you look at the top three, invest to shape sectors, invest to shape markets, invest to shape societies, invest to shape products, very low down. So what you saw was people were recognizing that if you want to operate in the long-term cycle, you have to change your dimensions and structures of investing to a fundamentally different model, which is allowing us to deal with complexity and contingents uh, in, a, in a different model. And the final point that I would say is, if you want to invest long term, they were looking for something called deep democracies. I think we're struggling to figure that out in the UK right now. But what is a deep democracy and how are we able to deal with it over a hundred year cycle? Deep democracies were a function of that. So what is, how do we create the fitness environment for long term thinking and long term environment is, is really critical. And democracy is a key part of that fitness environment. I won't take any more, any more of our time, but, um, but so a lot of the work we're doing is really exploring um, some of these issues and then getting into some of the financial instruments around that. But I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you, Indy, for a whistle-stop tour. And I'm sure, you know, there's, there's lots more we can dive into there, which we will do in the Q&A. Um, so before we get on to the Q&A, and folk, if you have questions, I invite you to start putting them in the chat. Um, I'm just going to quickly share some work we've been doing um, with different collaborators, including um, Dark Matter Labs, to try and operationalize long-termism in institutions. Um, so I will share my screen with you. Um, so this is a project that we've been doing with um, policymakers from all over the world to look at how do you start to get practical about cultivating long-termism in institutions. Um, and when we started doing this work, we came up with a framework to think about the different elements of long-termism. So to think about the operational elements of long-termism and then the cultural elements of long-termism within an institution. And so we did this basically to help the policymakers we were working with start to kind of map where are they already being long-term and how and where could they be long-term in the future. And so, you know, if you look at this, some of the elements here are very operational. Um, they are about you know, regulatory systems. They're about power structures. But there's also a lot that you can do in the terrain of organizational culture. You know, what are the symbols that you use in your organizations? What are the stories and myths? What norms do you incentivize? What rituals do you have? How do you start meetings? Um, and actually, one of the things we're trying to do here is to help people get practical today. Like, you know, we in this conversation um, are lucky to hear from people who are being very practical right now. But I think often in the field of long termism, it can feel overwhelming the scale of the challenges we face, the scale of the change needed. So, actually, how can all of us who are operating in organizations change things today to build demand for this wider structural change that we're talking about? 
So um, we decided that we wanted to get people working in government institutions to be the ones to design um, how they could work differently. So we ran sessions. Um, I won't show you a filled in Miro board because it will give you a migraine. Um, but this is the structure that we used where we got them to map onto these um, Miro boards what kind of long termism already exists what new opportunities could there be and what are some of the barriers to long-termism and we did this with like a real range of people and to Sophie's point about then how do you um, bring creativity into this space we then bought um, with the policy makers artists theatre makers dancers to help um, them think creatively about new ways of being long term and so this is the um, template that people were using uh, in these sessions to design new tools um, and we um, did this with people all over the world, so from local authorities in England through to the Ministry of Science and Technology in Taiwan, through to lots of different government bodies in Australia and Canada. Um, and the result has been really um, phenomenal in that uh, the amount of creativity unleashed um, but also the amount of interest uh, and I think one of the things that we found this year is that we thought that Covid might mean that it would be very hard for policymakers to have time to engage in uh, long-term thinking but actually what Covid has done is it has um, shown people that these existential risks that we face are relevant today and that we need to think about them today and so actually there's been there's been this huge appetite for the work so we have um pulled the designs of these policy makers from all over the world together into the long time tools um, i will post the link in the chat in a moment because at the moment we're asking people to test them to go and try them out in their organizations and to let us know how you get on um, and how you would improve them so um, this is something very practical that you can go away and do um, in addition to reading Roman's book, diving into Indy's articles, um, supporting Julia's and Sophie's work. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing now. Um, and I'm going to, before we open it up to the floor, um, I'm going to ask a question of all the panellists, um, which is a question about overcoming obstacles. So Indy talked very compellingly about all the ways that we're locked into short-termism. And so it'd be great to hear from you about what has been the biggest obstacle for you to overcome in your work and, and how you've done that. So I won't pick on anyone, but if one of the panel wants to jump in. I could say something here, Ella just in terms of overcoming obstacles. Um, I mean, there are so many obstacles and I think the lock-ins that Indy was talking about is, um, captures that very well. In terms of overcoming obstacles, what I find helps is what I tend to think of as peer-to-peer -peer inspiration. I love to see real world examples that I can feel I can help replicate somewhere else. So I see in Japan, this future design movement I'm talking about, uh, I've, I've talked about, um, for, which is a form of citizens assembly, really. And then I look at what Extinction Rebellion, say, is doing in the UK, calling for citizens assemblies. I think, all oh, right, here's a perfect way that XR or other organizations interested in deliberative democracy, participatory democracy, could be taking a model from somewhere else and just trying it out themselves, even not really knowing how to do it. Get some green gowns, put them on, pretend you're from 2060. And I think that kind of peer to peer inspiration works very well in terms of community organizations, but also for whole cities, even countries. So, for example, when Amsterdam um, adopted Kate Rayworth's donut economics model for its post COVID recovery, a few weeks later, Copenhagen suddenly says, ah, we're going to do this too. So, I think that kind of horizontal kind of inspiration works uh, very, very effectively and certainly gives me a strong sense of hope. I come in there. Um, yeah, I mean, 
very similar to Roman, actually. Um, part of the, um, you know, the sort of strategy that I set for, um, for my office, so I have a, um, a seven year term. Um, and in the sort of early strategy setting, we um, set a priority around building a movement for change. So a lot of that was about identifying who the frustrated champions are, because those are the people who want to drive change. Um, helping them with sort of you know with with tools encouragement sometimes going in and um you know what my mum would describe as knocking heads together further up um the chain and i suppose throwing a bit of commissioner um weight about um calling out where where barriers might be and then i suppose um you know certainly sharing the the best practice and we have seen that um, you know, the, the, the role in saying often really good things are happening in organisations, but strategic leaders don't even know that they're actually happening. Finding those things and saying, wow, look, look what's going on in your organisation. This, this is really good. This is exactly what we want through the Future Generations Act. Do more of it um, and spread that out to other organisations because there is an element of, you know, sort of competition and people want to not be seen as the um, as the as the laggards. Um, that said, there are sometimes people who just don't want to budge, and there I think you do just have to call them out. You have to you have to shame them um, into doing things differently. As I said, I don't have sort of powers to to force people to do anything or to to stop them doing things, but um, the kind of the shame approach, I suppose, was the most effective approach um, in terms of that. And for example, that I gave you. Yeah, I'll jump in there to talk a little bit about judges. Um, so I'll identify two hurdles and challenges. One is time. Um, going back to Ella's question from the beginning, we while this is such a, a long-term issue and all the work that we're talking about is so critical to do, there's also a real urgency right now and we are locking in more heat, right? So the, the timing of our of our actions and our transformation is so urgent. And the barrier we find in the courtroom is there, um, I would call it lack of courage, but the legal argument that is made by governments and that judges adopt is that climate change is a political question and there's not a role for the courts. And there's great irony in that because we've actually received opinions from judges telling minors, youth plaintiffs who do not have suffrage rights to go to the ballot box or to convince their, their political leaders to take on um, the actions that they're seeking through the courts. And so it's almost like we need a reclaiming of justice. We need courts to really embody their role as a third branch of government. And you know, while, I mean, I think the right of suffrage, the fact that children can't vote is a huge problem in long-termism. And where are we gonna give children the right to effectuate um, what they want in their lives and what they deserve, their rights to life and liberty and all of the things that the adults have. So that is our big hurdle. And what we're doing is we're using lots of areas of law, other children's rights cases to, really show courts that they, they have an obligation to step in, particularly when the youngest among us is being, are being catastrophically harmed by their own government, and that no political majority has the right to deprive young people of their lives and their freedom um, and their personal security and safety. Um, so we're, but it's, it's a hurdle and we're still figuring out how to, how to bust through that and it's happening around the world. I think just a small contribution to that um, and another perspective perhaps is that I think long-termism for me is not necessarily just about building things that last forever. And I think we often get locked into a thesis of building something that will last forever. Actually, in a complex emergent age, that is not necessarily the issue. The issue is creating the conditions for all of us to be conscious of our relationship to the future. So that's why I think what I think, and I'm, uh, to be slightly political, I think what the right has done very successfully is they've created the conditions for a future to emerge in a very particular format. And if you want a different future, it is about the conditions for that future. 
we often get, and I'm an architect, we often get focused into describing and building the future. But the real power is how do you create the conditions? And in those conditions are everything that Julia's talking about, you know, precedence, language, all those things create conditions. The final thing I'd say is those conditions that we see ourselves in were constructed conditions. They are not just natural systems. They are constructed conditions by super PACs, investors, vested interests to create a very particular worldview. And unless we are solid enough as a group to acknowledge that investment, I think it becomes very difficult to deal with it. I'm not saying, I'm not saying they're right or wrong. I think the point is we have to start by acknowledging that and thereby have a different time of day. So for me, the way of dealing with the future is about creating the conditions for the future, not necessarily by projecting all of those futures into the reality. So that's just... Great. Um, there are loads of great questions coming up in the chat. And so I think the way that we're going to do this, let's see if this is going to work. Um, all of the panelists, can you take a moment to have a look at the chat um, and to see what the question is that you'd like to answer in there? Um, and then each of you to answer one question from the chat rather than me decide what that question should be. Um, so if you will have a scroll through um, and then whenever you found your question, it would be great if you could read it out and, um, and then respond. I'm happy to go if, um, mainly because I'm gonna pick up on the, the last one. Um, it would be interesting to find ways to support municipal governments to implement processes and policies that support long-term. I find larger cities are more progressive and have more resources to explore long-term long options. How do you create the conditions for municipal governments. So um, I guess, you know, the example I'll give is, is um, obviously within the framework of our legislation. So it applies to our national government, um, our national Wales government that is, um, and it also applies to um, 43 other public institutions, including um, local authorities who obviously uh, govern each municipality area. It also applies to, um, to health boards who run our health service and to national organisations like Public Health Wales, Natural Resources Wales and, um, and so on. And each one of those um, each one of those um, organisations have um, duties to set wellbeing objectives um, which will maximise their contribution to um, all seven um, wellbeing goals. So that means it's again sort of quite interesting in that they have to work outside and beyond the scope of their immediate um, area of interest if, or you know the, the area that they're immediately responsible for. Um, so for example it's just as much um, the responsibility of um, the, um, the health board to deliver um, carbon reductions and a resilient whale, whales in terms of um, halting biodiversity loss and so on as it is to um, you know, treat people when they're, um, when they're ill. Um, it also requires them to set out in their wellbeing objectives how they have considered those wellbeing objectives um, in line with those, the five ways of working. So how the wellbeing objectives they've set are long-term objectives, how they'll prevent problems from getting worse, how they've integrated with each other, um, and who else they're working with to meet those um, objectives and how they're involving citizens. There's also then a, um, a, 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 a governance structure which is established called public services boards. So in each municipality area, all of the organisations have to come together um, through this public services board. Um, they also have to invite um, representatives of the voluntary sector, um, sometimes sort of further in higher education, um, sometimes the private sector and so on. And they have to collectively set a wellbeing plan um, of the things that they will be doing collectively to meet um, the, all of the wellbeing goals. So there's a kind of, I don't know, there's a, there's a framework there. There's loads of resources on my, um, on my website, including um, a, a future generations framework, which gives us kind of series of prompt questions, if you like, um, to, to prompt that kind of long-term thinking um, and um, how, how um, decision makers should be, should be doing that. I'm happy to go next. Um, I just picked up really actually on a comment from Frederick, which is this. Um, interesting how we can open meetings that reflect long-termism. In many countries with a strong indigenous cultural acceptance like New Zealand, the role of elders is very pronounced. 
and you honor the land and the indigenous peoples who have lived there, here adding the future forward would be quite natural. And what just that makes me think of is something we haven't really talked about, which is the importance of what we can learn about long-term thinking from uh, indigenous cultures around the world. So the mention of Aotearoa New Zealand there makes me think of the Maori concept of whakapapa, spelt with a WH, they're pronounced with an F, whakapapa, which is the Maori concept of lineage or genealogy. It's the idea that we are all in a great chain of being connecting the, the distant past and the distant future as well. And it so happens that the light is shining on this moment. And what we need to do really is broaden the light so we can almost see and almost feel that the living, the dead and the unborn are all here in this room with us. Or of course, there's the Native American idea, particularly in, amongst Iroquois and Lakota peoples of the idea of seventh generation decision-making. I know that some of the um, youth that Julia are working with are very inspired by that idea in fact, the future design movement I mentioned earlier in Japan is directly inspired by the idea of seventh generation thinking. And just connecting all this slightly to something that Indy was saying about precariousness. You know, when I talked to my father, who was a refugee from Poland to Australia after the Second World War, there was no long term thinking in his view. He was just trying to live here, survive right in the, in the present moment to deal with the housing crisis and the racism he was facing and so on. But one of the, and so of course, precariousness breeds and locks people into, uh, not necessarily through any fault of their own, a kind of myopic vision or a short termism. But at the same time, what's very striking to me is that often you find in indigenous communities around the world, people who are certainly not powerful or at the, at the top of the society in socioeconomic terms, they often it's those often powerless and marginalized indigenous voices that have really amazing long-term visions. I mean, one can't say that um, Maori peoples in New Zealand are a particularly privileged group, often living very precarious lives, but have deep cultural traditions, which are very long term. I think you can say the same among some you know, Native American groups, too. And then you see in Black Lives Matters, there's often a language about intergenerational justice. Um, so, for example, Leila F. Saad's excellent book, Me and White Supremacy, has the subtitle in the U.S. edition, not the U.K. edition, about being a good ancestor. And she thinks and talks about the um, struggles against racial injustice and criminal justice systems and so on as ones about um, long term struggles, because we have inherited um, legacies from slavery, from colonialism, which are written into legal systems, political systems, everyday culture. So we need to recognize that even those people living on the social margins often have much longer term visions than sometimes the very privileged people in society who are trying to lock us into, say, very narrow neoliberal visions of what the future should look like. Yeah, I completely agree with, with what Roman has said. And it's, it, it is really important to note that even though that first written law of the public trust was in 534, uh, indigenous traditions and cultures have long embodied that principle of, of protecting the life-giving resources for the future and it's actually embodied in all of the world's religions as well so i mean these are ancient human constructs that we shouldn't destroy the things that give life um, and not leave them for the next generation so i'll respond to dora who asks how is this kind of work financed and how is the global north global south dynamic come into play here um, and with the public trust doctrine so on the, on the first front um, our Children's Trust is financed by a mix of individual donations and, and foundations that support our work. And, and importantly, you know, about half of our budget comes from pro bono work. So I think um, they're just an amazing group of attorneys and scientists and other experts who donate their time to make this happen, um, for which we're enormously grateful. And the question of the global north and south is a very important one and we we think a lot about that in our work so a lot of our cases on behalf of youth are, are targeting the biggest polluters um, you know we went after the united states first because it is responsible historically for 25 percent of global greenhouse gas emissions my my country is the most responsible for the climate crisis and so we think, you know, those governments need to be held accountable for strict emission reductions and for the, the natural carbon sequestration efforts 
that are, are necessary to also help solve this problem. Um, but countries in the global south are really important too, not just for their their efforts to transition um, to clean energy systems and have prosperity for their people in a way that's sustainable on the planet. But oftentimes um, the global south countries and their courts and their constitutions are stronger than the global north. And so the, the legal precedent that can be built around the world um, to change these systems and the way we think is really important. Um, and you know, countries in South America are a good example of how they have constitutionalized the rights of nature, for example, many of them. And the public trust doctrine is written into constitutions um, in, in many of the countries that are least responsible for, for causing the crisis. And it also turns out that many of those countries have the, the soil and forestry resources that are very important for um, sequestering the carbon out of the atmosphere. And so their work often lies in that realm of protecting those resources. And so our work um, focuses on that end too. So I hope that answers some of your questions, Dor. Thank you. Um, I'll pick up the question about instruments and its form of instruments. So uh, the work that we're doing is um, focused on, um, so one of the big challenges we think is like, for example, the, the issue of trees. If you want to have a million trees in Milan or Madrid, how do you finance a million trees? And how do you extend the understanding of the value of trees, um, looking at their environmental, social, and also uh, even place-based benefits? So we did, we, what we've been looking at is how do you construct a mechanism to do that? And there are at least three dimensions to it, which I'll bring forth. Uh, one is effectively, in order to say, construct a perpetual bond or a hundred year, I would say a perpetual bond is what we're focusing on. You have to be able to deal with complexity and also volatility in different formats. So one of the things that we are seeing is some form of contingent uh, contracts and ideas of financing, which is contingent on actually how things vary and evolve is now increasingly possible as a result of actually machined models and machine, machine contracting mechanisms or smart contracts would be used in blockchain. But what that allows you for, to do is create contingent relationships with the future as opposed to fixed relationships with the future. When you combine that reality with actually looking at the services or the, the beneficiaries of those trees, heat island effects, so reduction in energy demand, or energy capital investment, uh, flooding risk management, or looking at um, sort of the uh, adjacent house prices going up, or the social benefits of the community urban forest, you can start to contract those beneficiaries in real time terms. The contract contracting those be benefits, so we're not talking about the treats, the value that it generates, then allows you to be able to finance it in new ways. So the dynamics, uh, the ability to absorb dynamics allows you to take time. The role of petrol bond means that you never have to recapitalize it. You never have to come back and pay the capital back. So you're servicing that. And over a hundred year cycle, the value of that bond is diminished to near nothing. Or over a 200 year cycle, um, you know, it diminishes significantly. So what you're building is the asset can't be recapitalized and the money taken out. So for example, a house bought in Notting Hill for 7,000, would in 2020, if it was funded by a perpetual bond, still be paying you interest rates on that would be, you'd be paying about 300, 400 pounds a year on interest for interest on that. So what you've suddenly taken is the capital appreciation, which is usually extracted off the table by using a perpetual bond. So we're looking at these instruments that allow us to be able to finance civic goods in really radical ways. And that's just the trees that can be linked off with multiple uh, civic assets, because we think civic assets are the fun foundations of a hundred year thinking model. So we're looking at those those, those tools. The other thing I'll, I'll point you towards is we've just done a really um, amazing piece of work with McConnell Foundation and also um, John Burroughs and his team, uh, various other collaborators around civic indigenous, uh, looking at new models of property rights, how we hybridize some of that thinking. You'll find that on our um, on, on our Medium blog are uh, looking at many of those issues of con going from property rights to be in treaty with and how do you be in treaty with the earth and how do you be in treaty with, with environments uh, in a different format. That creates a different form of relationship with what were historically non-economic, non-human actors or 
uh, not uh, resources rather than actors. So how do you start to actually treat them as actors to which we are in relationship to, moving us away from a human-centered world to actually part of an ecological system. So that's the sort of work. Those are some practical examples to manifest that conversation to the ground. Thank you. Great, thanks, Indy. Um, I'm going to pick um, Kenneth's question. Um, so he writes, any belief, ideology, pedagogy, system and institution are built on a view of human nature. Have any of the panelists been working on identifying the underlying views that are fundamental in thinking and acting more long term? Um, and so I guess um, Roman has, I know, and it's something that we've been thinking about at the Long Time Project, because really our focus is very much on the role of culture. Um, and we, a few years ago, um, thought about five pathways to the long term, which are also kind of five different perspectives on human nature. Um, and so I'll go through them very quickly. So one of them is deep time. So this is work that enables us to situate ourselves in kind of the epic geological history of the universe. Um, the second is uh, multi-generational emotions. So this is um, a view of human nature uh, that enables us to think of ourselves as part of an ongoing lineage of, um, of humanity. And this work is very much inspired by um, those indigenous concepts that, that both Roman and Julia talked about. Um, the third um, aspect of it is about legacy. Um, so this is about how do we think about what it means to be a good ancestor? Um, how, do we, how do we think about the world we leave for our descendants? The fourth is about death. So it's about mortality consciousness and really about how do we um, accept the fact that we are going to die and uh, deal with the fact that the world will continue without us and so start to develop care for that world that will exist beyond our lifetimes. Um, and the fifth element is one about interconnection. So how do we see ourselves as part of a web of life? So how do we decenter ourselves as humans um, and really see ourselves as part of a wider ecosystem? And again, this way of being is very much inspired by indigenous worldviews. Um, and so I think there's there's a lot to think about um, when it comes to long termism, both on a kind of personal existential level, like as you intimate in your question, um, Kenneth, this is about what it means to be human, but also then about what it means to be human together with others collectively. And I think that this conversation today has shone an, like an incredible light on different aspects of how we can get long term collectively. You know, whether that's in finance, whether that's in law, whether that's in politics, whether that's in philosophy. Um, and so I'm going to um, wind up because we are nearly at time. Um, but before I do, um, I, hope, I hope that today has been an inspiration um, for you all to think about how to balance the needs of the present and the like the urgency of the present with um with the long term and and an invitation to you all to come and get involved like roman talks about the time rebels and and everyone today in different ways has talked about how this work is already happening sometimes on the edges sometimes in the center um but it is it is a movement and a growing global movement so um come and be part of it um you can do that through connecting with any of the panelists and their work um, and through connecting with us at the Long Time Project. Like we exist to kind of support and grow this movement. Um, and so with that, um, I am going to let you all out into your days. Um, but first, just the hugest of thank yous for the panelists for kind of covering huge areas um, incredibly succinctly um, and, and, and responding to, to the questions with such insight. Um, and and an especial, especially big thank you to Julia, for whom it is still only 6.30 in the morning. Um, so everyone, um, go well. Um, uh, here's to the long time um, and have very happy Thursdays.